This is The Two Black Bottles, a dark and scary tale by H.P. Lovecraft and Wilfred Blanche Talman. Voices by Keechard Crow. The Deuterino. When the macho man. In a desolate village haunted by superstition and shadows, a young man inherits a dark legacy from his uncle, Dominie Vanderhoof, a preacher entangled in black magic. Summoned to the remote town of Dahlbergen, he encounters the sinister Sexton, Abel Foster, who reveals that Vanderhoof's soul was trapped in a bottle to keep him bound to his grave. Yet strange footprints and the fallen cross over Vanderhoof's resting place hint that the dead preacher seeks his soul once more, stirring fears that something unholy roams the churchyard under the full moon, cursed to wander endlessly in search of a lost purpose. Now we begin. Not all who yet breathe the gray air of Dahlbergen, that malefic hamlet crouched in the shadow of the Ramapos, would wager their souls that old Dominie Vanderhoof lies truly dead. They say he abides somewhere unmoored, damned, to hover between earth and judgment for the curse laid on him by that ancient sexton. But for the old conjurer's venom, he might still be heard haranguing his flock from the damp pulpit of that forsaken chapel, squatting upon the moor. For myself, having passed strange hours in Dahlbergen, I reckon there is truth to the village mutterings. No, I cannot swear my uncle is dead, though I am certain he no longer treads among the living on this earth. His burial by the sexton is not in question, but that grave in the churchyard lies hollowed now, for whatever slept there has since been roused. I near feel his breath behind me as I write these words, some ghostly prod compelling me to unearth the truth of those cursed happenings in Dahlbergen as they were in days now thick with shadow. On the fourth day of October, the cold autumn sun low in the heavens, I found myself summoned to that desolate village. The summons arrived penned by the hand of a former disciple of the old man's, one Mark Haynes, who wrote of an inheritance, meager but rightful, waiting upon the death of my sole living kin. Reaching that benighted place through wearying passage on branch rail and mud-rutted road, I stepped into Haynes's dusty store, a hollowed den choked with shadows, and he led me back into some airless chamber where he would tell me of the peculiar end of Domini Vanderhoof. Watch yourself, Hoffman, he warned me, low and steady. When you come across that old sexton, Abel Foster, he's bound to hell by a thread finer than hair. Not two weeks back, Sam Pryor passed the graveyard gate and heard that old devil speaking low with the dead. Weren't right, Sam said, and he swore something spoke back, a whisper half caught, as if the earth itself replied. They seen him talking to the moss on Domini Slot's grave, wringing his hands, addressing the stones as though he was speaking to the dead man himself. Uh. In this way did Foster come to that cursed hamlet some ten years before, hired by the Domini to tend the sodden church that served the dwindling souls of Dahlbergen. No man among them trusted him. His presence fouled the air as if he carried grave dust on his back. He would stand by the church door as the people came in, his bow servile, met with hard stares or the sidelong glances of women who clutched their skirts and swept past him, quick to shun his touch. On weekdays he haunted the graveyard, hacking at weeds and muttering spells to the wind, his hands off drifting over the grave of Reverend Gilliam Slot, the first domine who'd taken his seat upon the pulpit back in the year 1701. Not long after Foster took root in that soil, the dark began to seep from that stony hilltop into the flesh of the people. The mine in the mountain gave out, 
the veins of iron bled dry, and men left or took to scraping life from hard-scrabbled fields. But worse yet were the rumblings that reached the church walls. Whispers grew that Vanderhoof, the very shepherd of Dahlbergen's flock, had courted some unspeakable power. And his sermons, too, began to suffer the taint. Dark words, strange invocations, till those who sat in his pews felt themselves borne back upon terrible winds into dim ages of fear and blood. He spoke of horrors unseen, specters that crouched beyond firelight, and he filled their nights with the hauntings of shades and ghouls. So the congregation thinned, yet the Domini would not relent. Pleas from the elders fell upon deadened ears. Something older than his will rode him like a cruel steed and lashed him to its bidding. Johannes van der Hoof was a giant of a man by sight, but in the marrow of him ran something weak, some poor spirited substance that quailed before men as it would before the heavens. Yet for all his timorous soul, he would not cease his bleak sermons, nor would he heed the murmurings of his flock who wished him gone, until at last only a handful of folk gathered in that chill hollow on a Sunday morn. The village, impoverished, could not raise the coin to bring another pastor, and before long none dared to walk the moor to that forsaken chapel. It was said that Vanderhoof dwelt now among shades, that his words summoned forth spirits dark and ancient, things that fed on fear and shadow. So he lingered there. Old Mark Haynes told me, in that parsonage thick with mold and ghost light, simply for that no soul had the metal to drive him out. No man laid eyes on him again, yet each night a glow could be seen there across the fen, a spectral fire through parsonage panes, and now and again in the narrow church windows. Some said he held his sermon still, his lone congregation that twisted an ancient sexton, Abel Foster, who by night dwelled below in the church's stone basement and by day made his way into town to collect provisions. Yet there was a darkening of Foster's face now, and none who looked upon him mistook the malevolence that clung to his form like a second skin. Where once he bent in low obeisance, he now cast hate-filled eyes over the few souls left in Dahlbergen, glancing from the corners of his sight, never pausing in his work, nor granting anyone his voice, save for what was required to complete his business. He walked crooked as an old hickory root, and the cane he bore struck upon the cobblestones with a tapping that called to mind ill omens. Bent and shrunken as he was, still there radiated from his gaunt flesh that thing which the townsfolk knew well and dreaded, that force which, they claimed, had bound Vanderhoof to his doom, had made him bend his sermons to dark things and turn his heart toward the devil. All Dahlbergen knew that Foster had a hand in their woes, yet none dared even breathe his name aloud. They spoke only in furtive voices of the church beyond the moor, eyes forever watching the dark, lest some form should move there and set to listening. The graveyard, too, remained as it had, with stones straightened and flowers kept, green and well-tended, as if the sexton still drew his wages from some unseen hand. At times folk who ventured near saw him stooped among the tombs, speaking low, as if to hold counsel with the spirits bound within that place or with the devil himself. One morning Haynes said, Foster was seen cutting into the earth near where the church steeple threw its shadow in the early afternoon. At sundown, the bell, long silent, tolled, each peal falling like a dark benediction upon the air. Those watching from afar saw him then, the sexton, rolling a wheelbarrow from the parsonage, a coffin within its bed, 
and they watched as he tipped it into that raw earth, muttering his rights as he tamped down the ground above the box with rough ceremony. The next day, Foster came to town earlier than his custom, and a stranger air rode upon him, as if some foul joy stirred within him. He did not keep his silence, but spoke plain, remarking that Vanderhoof had passed from the earth the day before, his body now buried alongside Dominie Slot near the stone wall of the chapel. Foster's grin was not that of any man in sorrow, but held a terrible satisfaction, a delight deep and unholy. And there was in him a new dreadfulness, some added power that set even the boldest to trembling. Now that Vanderhoof lay silent, the village felt itself all the more bound to Foster's spells, his sway greater and darker than before. Muttering strange syllables in a speech none dared interpret, he moved along the road to the swamp, and in his wake he left a stillness that pressed upon the souls of all who remained. It was then, as I understand, that Mark Haynes recalled hearing the old Domini speak of me as kin, his nephew, a final tether to this world, perhaps, and so he had called upon me in the hopes I might hold some shard of knowledge that would unravel the strange fabric of my uncle's last years. I could tell him nothing, for what little I knew of Vanderhoof came second-hand from my mother, who had spoken of him only as a giant of a man with a spirit that faltered, a mind half-massed upon the tide. When at last Haynes had said all he had to say, I lowered the legs of my chair back to the floor and glanced at my watch. The day was waning fast. How far to the church? I asked him. Could I make it there before the light fails? His eyes widened in horror. Surely you're not fixing to go out there this night, lad. Not to that place. His hand, lean and trembling as the bones of the dead, reached out as though to restrain me. It's pure foolishness, he stammered, his voice breaking. I laughed him off, told him I'd not be troubled by bogeymen and old wives' tales, nor would I linger in this town one moment longer than necessary. I meant to face the old sexton that very evening and see this matter through. For I felt no fear, no horror, not of the ignorant tales these country folk had built like pyres around their dwindling lives. In my heart I was sure all I'd heard was but the workings of simple minds linking ill chance to dark specters and graveside rites. Seeing my mind was set, Haynes led me reluctantly from his dim chamber, all the while protesting and muttering. At last, with the sun beginning to cast long shadows, he gripped my hand and shook it with the look of a man who parts with the living for the final time. Mind that devil Foster don't get you, he called, his face pale and drawn. I'd not go near that fiend after sundown for all the earth's riches. With that, he re-entered his store and watched me depart, his head slowly shaking. The road took me out toward the edge of town, and I'd hardly gone a minute when the barren moorland yawned before me, stretching out like a corpse laid open under a sky of brackish gold. The road, shadowed by a pale fence, crossed over a sodden marsh where twisted underbrush hung low, the foliage steeped in decay and rooting down into black ooze. A reek of old death lay heavy on the air, and even in the light of that dying afternoon, the ground gave off faint whirls of vapor, curling up like specters rising from the clinging earth. I followed the path as directed, turning sharp left off the main road past a few sagging shacks, barely more than hovels, whose bleary windows and warped boards bespoke the poverty that gnawed at the bones of Dahlbergen's folk. Beyond these dwellings, 
The road passed under massive willows whose drooping branches closed above me, darkening the way until all warmth of the sun was shut out. The scent of the swamp lingered in my nostrils, and the air grew damp and cold, as if I had crossed some unseen threshold into a place where light and warmth were only shadows of memory. Emerging at last from that sullen gloom, I found myself back in the open, the sky washed with the smoldering red of twilight. Ahead, set low against the mountain's crest, lay the squat hulk of the church. The setting sun cast its crimson light over the stone edifice, bathing it in a sickly, blood-washed glow. There, in that dread silence, I felt a stirring of unease as if Haynes's forebodings had crept into my own mind. For there was a coldness, a malignancy that clung to the place like rot upon old flesh. The church itself stood squat and stony, crowned by a blunt steeple, and around it huddled the tombstones, leaning in eerie obeisance toward that silent idol, each stone's arched crest like the bowed shoulders of mourners in eternal devotion. Behind it all loomed the parsonage, its windows dark, its silhouette smudged against the dying light like a spectral hand held high above the graves. And I knew then, without doubt, that all in Dahlbergen had reason to shun this place. For there in that hollow upon the hill the air itself seemed burdened with the weight of unspoken things, old and malign, waiting for the final fall of night. I slowed my step as the scene loomed before me, for the sun was sinking fast behind the jagged crest of the mountain, and the dampness that crept out from the churchyard brought a chill that bit through cloth and flesh alike. I turned my collar against it and pressed on. Then I saw it, something pale set low against the wall of that dour chapel, a thing ill-defined in the failing light. I squinted, strained to make it out, and as I drew closer, I saw it was a cross of rough new timber, staked into a mound of fresh-turned earth. The sight brought a deeper cold into my marrow. This was my uncle's grave, yet it bore a difference, subtle and sinister, from the weathered stones surrounding it. This grave seemed to pulse with something other than death a strange sense that it was not wholly inert, not entirely at rest. Beside it, I noticed, lay another mound, a low, ancient heap with a headstone crumbling like old bone, and I knew it at once for the grave of Dominie Slot, that elder spirit whom Haynes had spoken of with dread. The place lay still as a stone under the settling dusk, I climbed the low rise to the parsonage and rapped upon its door, yet there came no answer. Circling the house, I peered through dim glass and found only darkness within, a desertion steeped in silence. Then, with an unsettling quickness, the mountain's shadow swept over, plunging the place into night before I had even reckoned the hour. I stood there barely able to see past my hand, and a deep quiet settled about me, a silence thicker than any I had known, untouched by wind or the skittering life of small creatures. For a moment I had set aside my apprehension, but it returned now, terrible and whole, and I felt as if unseen phantoms pressed in close, making the air cold and stale. I wondered then where that old devil Foster might be, and as I stood rooted in the darkness, I saw twin squares of light high in the church belfry. I recalled Haynes's words, that Foster lived in the dank depths of that house of worship hidden within its very stones. I moved forward, picking my way through the blackness, and found a side door half-cracked, waiting. Inside, the air was thick with the smell of rot and wet stone, 
Each touch of my hand met with a cold, clammy dampness that clung like the sweat of the dead. I struck a match to light my way, stepping lightly, probing the depths of the place. Then I halted, stricken. From somewhere above came a voice, coarse and soaked in liquor, belting out a song as vile as the drink had made it. The sound scraped through the empty church like claws on stone. My match burned to the quick and singed my fingers. I dropped it, plunging the world back into darkness. Ahead of me across the chapel, twin pinpricks of light pierced through the gloom, casting faint rays upon a doorframe outlined by light seeping through its edges. The song cut off as abruptly as it had begun, leaving a silence so complete that I could hear the hammering of my own heart, the blood pounding through my skull. I was fixed there, too stunned even to flee. I dared not strike another match. Instead, I moved forward by touch alone, feeling my way through the pews until I reached the door. A weight had settled on me, as if I had slipped into some waking nightmare, where each movement came not by will, but as though driven by some darker instinct. The door resisted my hand. The knob turned to no avail. The thing was locked. I hammered against it, but there came no answer. Only the silence, vast and unyielding. Tracing the frame, I found the hinges, rusted and soft with age, and pried out the pins until the door gave way, falling toward me with a hollow thud. A weak light spilled forth, revealing a stairway steep and narrow, and from below came the thick reek of whiskey. Above, something shifted, a low rustling, a moan creeping down the steps like a living thing. I called out softly, and some answering sound seemed to rise to meet me, an echo lost in a groan. Bracing myself, I placed one foot on the stair, then another, climbing slowly into the belfry's haunted gloom. My first glimpse of that accursed room staggered me for laid about in darkened heaps were books and scrolls layered in the dust of ages, manuscripts whose age and origin whispered of things lost to the memory of men. Shelves stacked high and reaching into shadows held a macabre collection of glass jars, and within them creatures were suspended, snakes, lizards, bats, all pickled in some foul preservative that seemed to writhe in the candlelight. Dust, thick as grave earth, and mold and webs clung to all things, as though death itself had settled in layers over each object. And there, behind a splintered table, its surface littered with a dim candle, a near-empty bottle of whiskey and a cloudy glass, sat a figure motionless, drawn and wrinkled like some desiccated thing that time had forgotten wild eyes staring blankly from a face of sallow ruin. I knew him at once for Abel Foster, the old sexton. He did not stir nor speak as I drew closer, half bound by dread and the oppressive silence that seeped from the walls. Mr. Foster, I managed to ask, though the sound of my voice seemed to reverberate as if lost in a deep cavern. The old man gave no reply, nor even a flicker of recognition. I wondered if he'd drunk himself into a stupor, and so I moved behind the table, my hand reaching to rouse him. At the barest touch upon his shoulder, the man leapt from his chair like a soul startled from the depths of a nightmare, his blank stare fastening upon me with such force I felt transfixed. His thin arms flailed before him as he stumbled back, his voice cracking with fear. Don't, don't touch me. Go back, go back. He shrieked, his voice raw. The old man was drunk. That much was clear. But there was more. A terror writ upon his features that seemed born of things unnameable. In a low tone, I told him who I was, why I'd come. He seemed to grasp this vaguely, his limbs loosening as he sank again into his chair. 
slumped and still as a spent wick. I thought ye was him, he muttered, his gaze unfocused. I thought ye was him come back for it. He's been a trying to get out, trying to get out since I put him there. His voice rose again, shrill as a crow's cry, and he clawed at the arms of his chair. Maybe he's out now. Maybe he's out. I turned, half fearing to see some ghastly form coiling up the stairs behind me. Who's out? I asked, my voice low. Vanderhoof, he howled. The cross over his grave keeps falling down in the night. Every morning I find it toppled and the earth all torn up, harder to press down each time. He'll break free and there'll be no stopping him. I pressed him back into his seat, seating myself on an old crate nearby. But his terror had him in a grip near unshakable, his spittle flecked and dripping from cracked lips. The very sight of him, his face twisted in that feverish dread, brought a creeping chill over me. I recalled Haynes's words, the dread he had spoken of when he told me of the old man's dealings. Indeed, there was something in Foster's face, in the sunken cast of his eyes, that seemed beyond human ken. His head sagged now, drooping toward his chest, as he mumbled incoherently, a man worn to threads. Silently I rose and opened a small window, letting a draft through to clear the thick reek of whiskey and the stagnant scent of rot that choked the room. Pale light from the rising moon drifted in, casting faint shapes over the graveyard below. From the belfry I could make out Vanderhoof's grave, a darker mound against the moonlit ground. I squinted, blinking as I gazed down at it. The cross over it leaned askew, though I remembered it had stood upright no more than an hour ago. A fresh surge of fear seized me. I spun back to find Foster watching me from his chair, his gaze oddly steady. So you're Vanderhoof's kin, Bushy, he murmured, his voice nasal and thick as though it had risen from his very bones. While you might as well know it all, he'll be back for me afore long, sure as I'm sitting here, just as soon as he can claw his way free. You might as well know everything now, boy. The old man's terror seemed to drain from him leaving him like a spent thing, hollow-eyed and resigned, as if to some dark fate he had long foreseen. His head sagged forward, and he mumbled on in that nasal monotone, a voice like wind scraping through barren fields. You see them books and them papers all laying there while them things was Domini Slot's Domini Slot, who was here in the old days, years gone. Their books of black magic, ye see, secrets the Domini brought with him from across the sea. They'd boil a man in oil over there for what he knew, but Slot kept it close. He'd preach from the pulpit like any holy man, but come night, he'd come up here and study his books, his jars full of dead things, and call down curses dark as pitch. None ever knew, not a soul, but the Domini himself and me. I leaned forward, words spilling from me before I thought. You? I, me, I come to know all this when I took up the job as sexton, found all this here mess waiting, and I set myself to reading it bit by bit, learned what old slot knew till I knew it all. His voice droned on like some charnel chant, and though fear bit at my senses, I sat there, held fast by his tail. The old man told of ancient rites, of chants that called down hellfire upon men, of strange formulas that bound the hearts of his neighbors, all delivered from the depth of his madness. He spoke of the spells he cast over the town and its people, until the walls of the church itself began to stir with dark forces that balked his power only when he sought to bind them utterly. But in Vanderhoof he'd found his mark a weak-hearted man ready to be led into madness, bewitched to preach sermons that thickened the air with dread, sermons that drove fear into the simple minds of the villagers. 
From his perch in the belfry, hidden behind a dark painting on the wall, he would fix his gaze upon Vanderhoof through eye holes cut where the devil's face stared down. And as the dominie's words poured forth like poison, the congregation fell away one by one, till Foster was free to work his darkness upon the church and the dominie alike. But what did you do with him? I managed, my voice coming out low and thin as though wrung from some hollow place. The old man cackled, a rasping laugh that split the air, his head thrown back in a mockery of mirth. Took his soul, he shrieked, his words jagged with malice. Took his very soul and put it in a bottle, a little black bottle, and buried him like any other corpse. But he ain't got no soul, and so he can't go to heaven nor hell neither. But he's a-coming back, ain't he? He's fighting his way up through the dirt even now. I can hear him down there, pushing through the earth, clawing for that soul of his. With each word, my certainty grew that this was no mere drunken ramble, that the old man spoke the terrible truth. Every piece, every word matched the tale Haynes had told me, and I could feel my terror coiling within me, rising by the inch. His cackling laughter filled the room, a sound unholy and fevered, until I felt near driven to flee down the narrow stair and never look back. Seeking any distraction, I turned again to the window, hoping for some small measure of calm. But there, in the dimness, I saw that the cross atop Vanderhoof's grave had sunk even further, now tilting at a perilous angle, near to falling entirely. Can't we dig up Vanderhoof and restore his soul? I asked, desperation clawing at my voice, the sense that something must be done before it was too late. The old man sprang to his feet, terror slicing through his features anew. No, 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 he screamed, his voice cracking. He'd kill me for sure, I forgot the spell, and if he rises, he'll be walking without no soul, nothing to hold him back. He'll kill us both. Aye, he will, sure as you're breathing. Where is the bottle that holds his soul? I demanded, advancing upon him with a fierce resolve. For I knew that some monstrous fate was slinking near, and that only through me might it yet be stayed. The old man's lip curled in a snarl. I won't tell you, ye whelp, he spat, his voice gone to gravel. And as he backed into a corner, there was in his eyes a gleam, queer and fevered. Don't come no closer, or you'll wish ye hadn't marked me. I was eating chicken tacos in the Baja before you were born. I stepped forward, my gaze falling on a low stool behind him. There, in the flickering candlelight, rested two black bottles, each dark as pitch and glistening like some venomous relic. As I moved closer, the old sexton muttered strange words, a chant low and sinuous, and a sudden grayness filled the room, blurring my vision. I felt as if something were clawing up my throat, dragging itself toward the air, and my knees trembled, weakened by some force I could not name. Fighting that spectral pull, I lurched forward and seized him by the throat, my other hand stretching out for the bottles. Foster stumbled, his foot striking the stool, and with a wild flailing he kicked one of the bottles to the floor, just as I grasped the other. The glass struck the boards and burst, unleashing a flash of blue flame, and at once the room filled with the bitter stench of sulfur. From the scattered shards rose a white vapor that gathered itself and drifted toward the open window, vanishing like a breath into the night. Curse you, you scoundrel, came a voice, faint and hollow, as if from a distant depth. I released Foster, who slumped against the wall, his face twisted with a hatred grown inhuman. His body looked smaller somehow, withered and drawn the skin turning slowly from sallow to a sickly greenish-black. Damn ye, 
the voice spoke again, and I knew it came not from his lips, but from some far, terrible place. I'm done for. That one you broke. It was mine. Dominie Slot took it out 200 years ago. His voice faded as his body seemed to collapse in upon itself. He slid to the floor, his flesh mottling, darkening to black and then to a jaundiced yellow, as if the life were rotting out of him. His features shrank and split, his skin clinging to bone. And as I watched, his very body crumbled like decaying parchment, his clothes collapsing inward until all that remained were folds of limp, empty fabric. The bottle in my hand began to grow warm, and I looked at it in horror. A faint, sickly light began to glow within its depths, and I, seized with a fear beyond words, set it down upon the table, though my gaze was fixed upon it. The glow grew brighter, pulsing like the beat of some unholy heart. And in the dead silence that followed, I heard a sound from the earth outside, the slow, shifting slide of soil. I staggered to the window and peered out into the moonlit churchyard. The cross above Vanderhoof's grave had fallen, lying flat upon the mound. I heard it again, the trickling of loose earth, and a primal terror overtook me. Unable to stand it a moment longer, I turned and stumbled down the narrow stair, blind with dread. Out into the night I fled, running over the uneven ground, stumbling and falling, each step clawed by the terror that hunted me. When I reached the edge of the hill, where the road disappeared beneath the black arch of willows, I stopped, hearing a hideous sound that froze my blood, a bellowing roar from beyond, from the churchyard. Against the cold gleam of the church wall, I saw it then, etched in moonlight, a loathsome, towering shadow clawing its way free from the earth. That monstrous shape, black as the grave and unholy as sin, pulled itself from the broken soil and turned, floundering toward the church, its vast, rotting mass silhouetted in the pitiless light. The next morning I recounted my tale to a knot of villagers gathered in Haynes's store, they listened, expressions fixed somewhere between a smirk and a scowl, their eyes darting to one another with a look of private amusement. When I put forth the notion they accompany me back to that place, however, the murmurs died, and each man found reason enough to stay put. Farm chores and sore limbs, family business, pressing obligations. Though they held my tale in a measure of doubt, none among them wished to tempt fate, nor court whatever lingered in the shadows of that churchyard. So I declared I would return alone, though I confess a chill settled deep within me at the thought. Just as I reached the door, an old man with a beard, white and thin as cobwebs, hurried after me, his step quicker than one would expect. He caught hold of my arm. Hey, uh, I'll go with you, dude, he said, his voice rough but steady. Seems I heard old Walter talking about that, something to do with the, the ins and outs, you know? Like possibly, uh, um, it might be like something to do with old Dominie Slot. Total bummer of a man, most people say. But it seems like, you know, Vanderhoof has been much, much worse. When we reached the gravesite, we found Dominie Vanderhoof's tomb yawning open, the earth disturbed and empty. There was talk of grave robbers, some poor wretch after rings or silver buckles, but neither of us could believe it fully. In the belfry above, the bottle I'd left upon the table was gone though the shards of the broken one lay scattered across the floor. And upon the heap of yellow dust and crumpled clothes that had once been Abel, Foster, 
were pressed strange, vast footprints. Each print immense, inhuman in its shape and depth. We sifted through the old manuscripts and grim books, pages brittle with age, stained with symbols and signs that made the skin crawl. We carried the foul papers down the narrow stairs and burned them in the yard, feeding the flames with a spade we found rusting in the basement. When we were done, we filled in Vanderhoof's grave and flung the toppled cross upon the fire as well, letting it burn down to smoldering coals. Now the old wives say that when the moon rises full over that blighted ground, a giant figure moves among the graves, wandering with a bottle clutched in its hand, bound to some forgotten task, some nameless quest in the night-shadowed fields of Dahlbergen, searching and straying in endless, aimless grief.